So our three speakers today are Andrew Oswald, Nicola Rehaney, and Elizabeth Dunn. Um, and we'll hear them in that order. So Andrew Oswald is Professor of Economics at the University of Warwick. His research is on economics, statistics, and quantitative social science, including work on the determinants of human happiness and psychological well-being, the influence of home ownership on the Western nation's labor market, the role of randomized trials in the design of social and economic policy, and the behavioral influence of human diet. Ooh, interesting. He serves on the board of editors of Science. He's an ICI highly cited researcher. He's a member of the Stieglitz Commission into the Measurement of Social Progress and Human Wellbeing. And he serves on the main panel of the, okay, Lover Who, my right, trust. <laughs> um, Andrew's recent publications include articles on the life cycle happiness of chimpanzees and orangutans, the influence of happiness under human upon human predictivity on randomized controlled trials, the role of wisdom in aging, and longitudinal evidence for the existence of a midlife Nadir in humans, which I think is what he's going to be talking about today. It's interesting. Our second speaker is Nicola Rahaney, who is a senior research associate at University College London Research Department of Genetics, Evolution, and Environment. She is interested in the mechanisms that underpin cooperation. In particular, she's interested in why individuals invest to help one another when they would seemingly do better but to behave in a more self-interested manner. So why do we get that warm glow? Why is warm glow important to us? She's worked on a variety of non-human model systems and has recently become increasingly focused on human decision-making in the context of cooperation. She employs insights from evolutionary biology, economics, and psychology to ask when and why people are motivated to help others. And finally, we're going to be hearing from Elizabeth Dunn, who is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of British Columbia, where she conducts original research on happiness. Her work has been featured in hundreds of media outlets, including the New York Times, The Economist, and The London Times. With Michael Norton, she is the co-author of this book, Happy Money, The Science of Happier Spending, highly recommended, um, which was selected as one of, one of the books, 20 books every leader should read by The Washington Post. Elizabeth uses experimental methods as well as big data sets to examine how individuals and policymakers can most effectively transform wealth into well-being. For example, in a published paper published in Science, she and her collaborators demonstrated that people derive greater happiness from using money to benefit others than themselves, which I think correlates with some of the stuff we are hearing about cheating Dan Ariely this morning. Interesting. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Andrew Oswald up to the stage. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's very nice to see everyone here. Humans self-evidently, I'm going to need that. Humans self-evidently have feelings. Uh, anger, you may have experienced it occasionally, ladies and gentlemen. Boredom, sadness, and even, even among researchers, happiness every now and then. <laughs> I'm going to be interested in happiness, or more broadly, the sense of human well-being and in particular its pattern over the life cycle. So humans have feelings, and I hope I can take it as read that feelings really matter for us. Now what happens as we get older, unless you're extremely unlucky, you're going to age as I have. What will happen to you if you're young and you're going to go into midlife and then you're going to get older, or perhaps uh, you are in later life, what will happen after that? This is what I intend to be like at 80. I'm the taller of the two here in my mind. Unfortunately, I can't currently persuade my wife to wear this tie-dye dress. Is there scientific evidence for, along the way, the very common intuitive notion, the layman's notion of a midlife low or a midlife crisis? Is there real scientific proof of that? That's what we'll look at. If you type midlife crisis into the internet, what you get, the British people in the audience will understand this, is large numbers of pictures of a man called Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> you can also purchase on the internet, I've discovered, uh, midlife crisis pills. But I can't honestly, as a scientific researcher, recommend you to purchase and consume these pills. The bottom line today will be the following. There really is mounting evidence for a midlife low. I'm reluctant to call it a crisis because people might have different notions of that, but there is a midlife nadir. I'll show you lots of evidence for that. Remarkably to me, anyway, it seems to happen equally in men and women. I find that remarkable because, of course, the hormonal rhythms of life over 70, 80, 90 years are rather different for men and women. 
But in the data, this shape appears rather similar for males and for females. I would say in 2015, this is unexplained. Of course, I'm going to give you the current theories, but I don't think we understand this at the moment. And finally, there's a chance in uh, this year, it's still rather early to say, that there's a possibility that somehow very deep in our biology is primates, somehow deeply physiological or hormonal. And I'll come back to that. Now, how on earth do researchers study this kind of topic? Clearly, happiness is an immensely complex but interesting uh, phenomenon or topic. And one approach has been, in the, in the sense that epidemiologists treat uh, topics to take large random samples of people from many countries, this is what I've spent 25 years of life doing, I suppose, trying to understand what explains the pattern of happiness across different individuals. Think of us in this room, what explains the happiness of us, 100 or 150 people. And second, perhaps even more important, what explains the pattern of happiness across different nations? So what makes a happy person? And what makes a happy country? Clearly very difficult, but surely very interesting issues. To do this, we use regression equations. I'll have people in the audience who are experts in this and others who probably know nothing about this. If you, if you don't know about regression equations, again, think how an epidemiologist works out whether it's a good idea not to smoke or to eat fruit and vegetables. We take individual people, think of them as dots on a huge electronic piece of graph paper, and we look for patterns in the clouds of dots. That's what regression equations boil down to. And if you care about equations, this is the sort of function that we fit, where you could think about this as a giant recipe. All the things on the right-hand side get mixed together, and out comes your happiness, you might say, speaking loosely. When we do this kind of work longitudinally and looking at cross-sections, we find big effects from these sorts of factors, exactly what you'd expect intuitively divorce and bereavement and health and so on, you might think, well, we don't need equations to know that these are the things that really matter to humans. And that would be fair. But of course, in this way, we produce a number of results that are not so intuitive, like the uh, lack of effect, I would say, from having children. I can't advise you to have children if you want that as a route to happiness. <laughs> And we can put different uh, relative sizes on these with the equations to work out the relative importance of one life event to another. Now here's the key fact for today, in brief. Over the bulk of the healthy lifespan, if you are a regular person, you're going to slide down, the best of luck while you're doing it, <laughs> you're going to slide down this giant U-shape if you're the average person. Just as in epidemiology, some people can smoke and still live to 102. We're just talking about statistical averages here. So those in their 20s are happy, those in their 60s and 70s are happy. This is just uh, about 80,000 randomly sampled British people, we'll come on to more. And the interesting thing is that a quadratic equation fits remarkably the period in between. Now this holds in all sorts of settings. These, these are the latest ONS data, Office of National Statistics data from my country. As many people here will know, but not all, we're collecting now systematic happiness data. This is from the question on how happy were you yesterday, about 100,000 randomly sampled people. These are different ages, the people at the back won't be able to see, but that's about age 48, and that's about age 100. Of course, there aren't too many people out there. That's the life cycle controlling for other influences. You might call it the deep age effect on happiness. And I'll show you the United States now for 400,000 randomly sampled Americans from something called the BRFSS. You might remember that shape. Here's the... Here's the, American, I can't, uh, here's the American shape. So it's almost identical. This big nadir, minimizing in the US about maybe age 44, but I wouldn't want to quibble between 44 and 48. I've seen this pattern since about 1991, when I first got interested in such data. Uh, you can get it in all sorts of ways. If you look at probability of depression equations, now we're looking for hump shapes. I can't go through this in detail, but you get the sense of it. That's for hundreds of thousands of British men, hundreds of thousands of British women. Again, a hump shape in the probability of depression. And say you don't believe happiness survey data at all, or any kind of psychological <coughs> well-being scores. Say you don't. What are you doing in this room? <laughs> say you don't. Uh, even if you reject all of that, then if you look at the probability of taking antidepressants, as a planar signal, you might think, for distress. Then this is across many European nations. This is done with Blanche Flower. Uh, we show that the probability of taking antidepressants if you're a European, factoring out other influences on your life peaks 
about age 46 or 47. Now what causes the midlife dip? I, I'm going to give you some ideas and then stop. It's nothing to do with having young children, even though they're delightful, as you can tell. <laughs> and it's found all over the world. Uh, we're up to about 65, 70 nations so far. Some of these data sets are enormous, 10 million observations, some are tiny, 1,000 people. So we have a long way to go scientifically. Why does it exist? Until recently, I certainly believed this for 15 years, the standard theory was one of thwarted uh, aspirations. I wanted to lead the England soccer team out on the Wembley soil and beat the Germans in the World Cup final. No offense to Germans in the audience, but I couldn't make it. That's the notion. Eventually, yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but of course, I couldn't achieve that, and I, nor could I become a CEO. The, the standard theory was that we set ourselves very high goals. Mostly we fail, that's painful, and then we come to terms with our imperfections. And you might say we learn to be happier and we can go up the right-hand side of the U. That's just a theory. That was probably the leading theory. Midlife crisis equals dreams divided by reality plus wrinkles. I don't, I don't teach this equation in mathematical economics classes at Warwick, but you get the idea. Uh, now, now it's much harder to believe that, and that's because of this fellow here. Uh, and, and this paper written with some primatologist colleagues and an iconoclastic psychologist at the University of Edinburgh called Weiss, where we had the idea of, um, might it be the case that other kinds of primates have the U shape? Might it be the case? And uh, you can guess that we find that's true. There's the U shape in humans, and there's the U shape in great apes, published a couple of years ago in one of the scientific American journals. Now we're in the fog of research here. We're right up against the frontier. This will need to be replicated. The happiness level I'm speaking loosely is the psychological well-being of the animals as assessed by multiple keepers. I can't today go through the details. We had a sam two samples, separate samples of chimpanzees in different countries and one of orangutans. And just drawing to a close, if you've noticed, I've given you what you might be able to work out. It's a great deal of cross-sectional evidence over and over again for different nations, different periods. And you might believe that looking at repeated cross-sections, even when you get the same pattern over and over again, might be unreliable. But in our forthcoming work, we take tens of thousands of German families and British families and Australian families, trace them over long periods of time using only longitudinal patterns, only the changes, you might say, in the jargon, within person, within person in the jargon. And we find the same thing. Uh, technically, that's difficult just to, for the specialists here. We had the idea of exploiting the simple fact that if you know you're looking for a quadratic equation, and you remember your standard elementary calculus, when you differentiate that, you get a linear equation. You can search for a linear equation in the rate of change of life satisfaction longitudinally. That gets you around a number of famous statistical difficulties. What lesson might be drawn, ladies and gentlemen? Well, it appears to me that a midlife crisis, if I'm going to use those words, a midlife low, uh, may be natural. If it really exists in other kinds of primates, <laughs> maybe the people at the front can see the motorbike he's thinking about. Um, if it really exists in primates, then it's probably Nothing to do with social science, nothing to do with the air in Western society or what we're eating or the divorce rate or whatever, television. But we just don't know. This is the puzzle that remains to be understood. If you are sliding down the U-shape, I'm happily oldish. I'm accelerating up to bliss, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I recommend my age. Uh, anyway, the very best of luck with the U-shape. Thank you. <laughs> And based on your data, I'm probably the happiest person in the room because I'm, because I'm 71. Um, so the question is, would it be interesting to look at why older people are happier, happier in a way of it illuminating the question you were addressing? My possibility would be that going back to the last session, the, the rationalizing brain kicks in and says, look, you're running out of road, why not enjoy it? Um, that, that can make you happier in a way maybe the midlife crisis still thinks it's got some possibilities, some foolish dreams to have. So this, this creative theory, you, 71, you're, you're close to the maximum, 73 is the maximum. 
in Western society, but it doesn't drop off. Huh? Your creative theory is impending death makes you value the years more. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I said that you rationalise it, that it is going to be wonderful. In petty that doesn't come into it, just you're running out of road, perhaps. Silly. All right. Um, I thought it, I put it in a rather pithy way then. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I think that there's got to be a lot of intuitive sense to that. Uh, your, one of your difficulties, though, is the apes. Because it's tricky to believe that they know about the normal lifespan of apes, which is about 55, if you're interested, about half. You can divide everything by two compared to humans, 50 or 55 in apes. So that's hard to believe. Possible. They're very like us. They'll have seen lots of other apes die. Um, but that, that, that is a possibility. It's just that if it was something to do with the big T, we call it in economic theory, <laughs> the end of your life, big T. Um, then I, I don't see why we'd have this turning point. You see, wouldn't it be a smooth ride up to big T? That's what it, how you expect. But it's, it's an interesting idea. Thank you. We've got another question right at the back there. Right at the back. Yeah, I just had a quick one about the apes and whether or not they were apes in captivity um, or whether or not they were somewhere. Yeah, so we're in captivity. It's very hard to do the so. <laughs> so, you know, whether or not that was kind of applicable to, to humans, but possibly not to wild apes. Because I was thinking, for me, I was thinking, you know, you start getting depressed when you start work, and maybe you finish and you retire, and maybe there's some equivalent of right? <laughs> Okay, I, I guess I didn't really need to reply to that, did I? Which is about the captivity, maybe. Um, these are apes in captivity, we have five or six hundred of them, yes. So it kind of struck me that I'm at the very top of that U shape. I'm about to fall down like a very depressing life over the next 20 years. <laughs> and um, I was kind of wondering what sort of mitigating factors can you put in place to stop yourself falling down that U shape? Um, I get off where, where, yeah, where I work, we do a lot of stuff on um, the five ways to well-being developed by the New Economics Foundation, which we kind of base our whole business model on the five ways to well-being. And I was kind of wondering what sort of things can you do to stop me falling down that U shape? Yes. Uh, of course, I tend to think about the U-shape as a background force in our lives that we can't get rid of. But uh, as implied by my list, you, you remember our unemployment and bereavement and so on. Lots of things clearly shape human happiness. So if you can have more of the, the happy uh, factors in midlife, if you can arrange that, that will help offset that. Uh, marriage, uh, income, these have beneficial effects. I strongly recommend, I'm not talking about it today, you to eat a lot of fruit and vegetables for happiness, way beyond anything to do with physical health. I suppose you'd have to read the, the excellent books by Elizabeth and others on the happiness literature to go through the, the things that can offset the age effect. I'm sure it's obvious to all of us, we have fantastically good lives by the standard of almost any country in any era in human history. So just because we lose a life satisfaction point, that doesn't mean to say that we're miserable in a broad sense of few people are in midlife. Unfortunately, in our country, the peak suicide age, uh, overseas researchers may not know this, the peak suicide risk age in Great Britain is now 45 years old. So uh, very probably some of that, I'm afraid, is a much more serious midlife effect. Okay. Uh, roughly for men and women, of course, women commit suicide a great um, a, a, a lot less. It's about um, eight times less, if I remember correctly. Okay, we got a question from Natalie back there. Um, I was just wondering, there's some research around gender disparity for marriage and whether it makes men and or women. Yes, I've worked on this a lot. <laughs> have you, what have you found in that region and is it changing? I don't know whether it's changing. I haven't worked explicitly on that for a few years. I'd be surprised because these patterns certainly change a great deal. But both men and women benefit enormously from, uh, from being married, at least as far as we can tell. Marriage is not randomly assigned, you understand? <laughs> as far as I can make the scientific judgment. And I would say they benefit to a similar degree. Now, on physical health, the balance of the evidence is not quite the same. Occasionally, 
I joke to men that if you must smoke, it's essential to get married. <laughs> because smoking, smoking takes about eight years off your life, and uh, marriage seems to put about eight years on your life if you're a man. <laughs> but it only puts about four years on your life, on average, if you're a woman. Uh, so there's a, a slight a difference between the happiness data and the physical outcome data there. But my instinct is it's roughly equally beneficial in happiness units for males and females. So I recommend it if you can find the right person. Yeah. Okay, so we've got time for about two more questions. So let's find one here and one here. Uh, when you measure the happiness, uh, would it be beneficial to measure it a few times a day and so make it a little bit more, maybe more realistic uh, rather than people maybe trying to uh, appease or whatever, gratify the uh, uh, investigator? Uh, it, it would uh, just make sure people heard, um, shouldn't we be measuring happiness repeatedly through the day? It's hard to be against that. The repeat observations would probably help our statistical power. But you see, we're getting such a lot of statistical power <coughs> other ways. Um, sometimes there are regressions of with three or four million randomly sampled people that uh, I'm afraid I don't think it would make any difference. If I had a sample of just, say, 150 people, then I would need to clean up the data as best I could with repeated sampling. But uh, the U shape through life, if I may call it that, is it's incredibly general in data sets I've seen for nearly a quarter of a century. I don't, I don't think I've ever uh, failed to see it in a data set, although a few researchers, of course, inevitably have claimed that they can't. Okay, and one at the end, and then we'll wrap up and move on to the next session. But remember, we can still ask more questions at the very end of all of this. Just two quick questions. Um, have you considered the possibility that the keepers rating happiness are anthropomorphizing apes and considering they've got a midlife crisis because that's what humans do? Um, and second, what is the, your biological explanation or, or possibility or evolutionary reason why this yes. has happened? I'm afraid I haven't got a biological explanation. I've been doing some work on uh, cortisol patterns through life, but that hasn't led anywhere at the moment. If you can work on that, um, very good luck to you. You might get through there, but I haven't managed it. Um, as for the keepers, well, uh, I'd love to think that all the keepers in these zoos around the world have been reading our research on the U-shape of happiness, but I suspect they haven't. And second, they would have to do an awful lot of mental arithmetic normalization, wouldn't they? They'd have to know that for humans, the minimum comes around age 45. They have to scale it down to the apes have a minimum around age 21 although it remains a theoretical possibility. I don't think that's the natural explanation for the quadratic equation in apes. <laughs> Great. Um, I think that we're going to wrap it up for now. So thank you very much to Andrew. Hi. OK, um, before we get started, if uh, you don't mind, I would like to ask a question of the male members of the audience. <laughs> Could anybody please volunteer to me? Um, maybe someone sitting in the front row. What is, it's like a comedy event, isn't it? What's the, what's the most you've ever spent on a shirt? On a shirt? Yeah. Uh, $30. $30, okay, so about 15 pounds. Um, any advances on 15 pounds? 150. 150 pounds. Okay, so 150 pounds. Um, Perhaps it might surprise you to learn that even more expensive shirts are available. <laughs> and in fact, the shirt in this picture, which is worn by a Mr. Data Puget, is made entirely of gold and is reputed to be worth around $250,000. That's quarter of a million dollars for a shirt. <laughs> now, you might expect that for this price, that should be the best shirt in this man's wardrobe. But in fact, you'd be wrong. In fact, this item performed very poorly as a shirt. It weighs around three kilograms, which is about the weight of a newborn baby. It can't be washed. And Mr. Puget has to enlist the help of a security guard to accompany him whenever he wears it. So, this doesn't really sound like the most practical of items to me. So what is going on here? Well, in fact, this shirt is not meant to function as an item of clothing. This shirt is, in fact, a signal. It's a signal to other people about Mr. Puget's extraordinary wealth. Who else but the very rich would afford to spend such a sum on such a silly item? 
Well, in fact, this concept of signalling has a very deep root in evolutionary biology. So if we consider the male peacock's tail, on the face of it, such a tail seems like a very strange thing to have evolved. It is hugely costly to carry that tail around in terms of energy expenditure and susceptibility to predators. And the tail of this peacock doesn't really seem to have an obvious function. But we do know that males actually benefit from having such a large tail because for female peahens, size is important. Females prefer the males with the biggest tails. And this leads to an arms race among males to grow bigger and bigger tails in order to win the attention of the females. Now, why should females care about the size of a male's tail? What's in it for a female? Well, it turns out that having a very, very large tail is a good indicator of a male's underlying genetic quality. So by having a large tail, a male can signal to a female, I've got good genes, these will get passed on to our babies if we have any. And it, it pays for a female to pay attention to that signal because then she can maximise the quality of her offspring. And this huge tail might seem to be quite a costly way of making a point about genetic quality, but in fact, the cost of the signal is absolutely crucial in enforcing its reliability or its honesty because cheaper signals would allow lower quality males to fake it and deceive females into believing that they're higher quality than they really are. So the cost of the signal ensures the reliability for the receiver. Okay, so today what I want to talk about to you is about charitable giving. And what does this have to do with peacocks and gold shirts? <laughs> well, it turns out quite a lot. So today I'm gonna to uh, present to you evidence that men, just like male peacocks, compete with one another over size in order to win the attention of the ladies. But in this case, we're talking about the size of donations rather than the size of tails. Okay, so we know from previous work that men and women prioritize different <coughs> things when they're looking for sexual partners. Men t tend to place higher emphasis on signals of fertility, which are broadly linked to attractiveness, whereas females, on the other hand, place more emphasis on wealth and helpfulness in males. And both of these characteristics can be signalled by charitable donations. So men can signal to women that they're both wealthy and helpful if they make large charitable donations. And this led us to predict that when giving to charity, men <coughs> might compete with one another in the size of donations, especially when they're, when they're giving in the presence of attractive females. And we tested this prediction using real-world data from online fundraising pages. Okay, so here's what a fundraising page looks like. Um, the fundraising pages are used by individuals who want to perform um, events or tasks in order to raise money for charity. They can post what they're doing online and then contact people in their social network and ask them to donate via these online fundraising sites. So pages will typically have a profile photo of the fundraiser, the person who's doing the activity, raising the money for charity. They'll also have the target that that fundraiser is hoping to achieve, the amount they're hoping to raise for their charity. And importantly for our analysis, on most fundraising sites, all the donations that every fundraiser gets are listed on the page and are all visible and sequential to everybody who arrives at that page. And this creates what we call a generosity tournament or a potential generosity tournament where donors can both see and respond to what others have done before them on that, on that page. So the first question to ask was, do donors actually pay any attention whatsoever to what other people have given? Do they care? Does this affect how much they give? And it turns out that yes, it does. So um, this work was done by my co-author, Sarah Smith, and what she found is that um, when donors arrive at a fundraising page, if they arrive after a large donation has been made, and here we define large as being at least 50 pounds, then what you tend to see is that all the donations after the large donation are slightly larger on average. So these, this is the large donation, and th these are the donations after, 
these are the donations before. And what we see is that after the large donation, you're seeing around about a £9.50 increase in donation size. And this effect persists for at least 10 donations after the large donation. So we know that people do care about what others have given and they change their own behaviour accordingly. And what we wanted to know whether was whether could some of this upswing in donation size be explained by competition among male donors? And that's what we tested. We tested this using over 11,000 pages collected um, from a single major fundraising platform. And all of the pages we used were fundraisers who were doing the 2014 London Marathon. And of this sample that we had, um, the mean donation size that was given on, on pages was around £30 per donor. And the average amount that each fundraiser raised was in excess of £1,000. So of this initial sample, for every page where a fundraiser had uploaded um, one profile picture, we had that photo rated independently for attractiveness. Um, by four independent raters on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is not at all attractive and 10 is extremely attractive. And then we asked, what happens on these pages after a large donation? What do donors do after a large donation? And in order to answer this question, we had to calculate the average size of, all of the donations leading up to the large donation, and we call that the pre-average. And then what we're asking is, after the large donation, which is at least £50, how much bigger than the pre-average is each individual donation after that large donation? And do, does the increase in donation size vary according to whether the donor is a male or a female and whether they're giving to a male or a female fundraiser and how attractive that fundraiser is? So, to, to show you, there's only one graph to show you, but it's, um, it's all going to pre be presented on this slide. So, to walk you through what I'm going to show you, um, the, what you're going to see in the bars is the increase in the donation amount following a large donation. And I'm only showing you the responses here that were that are made by male donors. So, I'm only showing you male donors' responses to large donations, but I'm going to show you their responses to large donations when the large donation was made by another male, i.e. a competitor, or when it was made by a female. And then we are also just going to break down the responses according to whether or not they're giving to female or male fundraisers respectively, and how attractive these fundraisers are. So just to give you the attractiveness, how, how attractiveness is scored. The size of the icon depicts basically how attractive the fundraiser is rated as being. So the bigger the icon, the more attractive the fundraiser and obviously the smaller it, are less attractive for males and females respectively. Okay, so what did we find? Well, we found that for, across all conditions, seeing a large donation on a fundraising page caused men to give more money. So we saw that across in every condition. But the biggest effect that we saw, and the only condition which was significantly different to all the others, was in precisely the scenario where we predicted it, which was when men are responding to a large donation made by another man, and when they're giving to the most attractive female fundraisers. So this is the only case where we saw a competitive response and the effect size here was huge. It was m more than four times the size of um, the effect size in any of the other conditions. So this was quite striking. Um, and I think that um, what we would like to stress is that we're not necessarily saying that these responses are conscious or um, designed to, to necessarily um, to sway females in a, conscious, in a conscious way, but rather that these tendencies are probably the product of an evolved psychology that, that has evolved to maximise the benefits of being altruistic or being helpful in different contexts. And more broadly, I think that evolutionary biology has a huge role to play in the development of nudge theory 
in helping us to develop a more predictive theory of nudge nudge type situations when nudges are likely to work so for the most part i think to date most of the people who've been working on um, behavioral insights into uh, in into in in this in this field have focused on how context influences our behavior and a lot less attention has been paid to why these effects might occur from an evolutionary point of view and i think that's somewhere where there is massive room for growth in the coming years in in terms of research agenda is to help us to try and understand why we why we behave in these unusual ways and why we have cognitive biases and 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 things like that and then finally very quickly i'll just finish with some tips if any of you are thinking of hosting a fundraising page these are some of the things that we've realized are important by our by our analysis so the best, one of the best things you can do if you're thinking of hosting a fundraising page is to upload a profile picture. Pages with pictures raise more money than pages without pictures. When you upload your profile picture, make sure you smile. Smiling people are perceived as more attractive and, the, and that's linked to an increase in around 10% of, of, in the amount of money that's raised relative to non-smilers. And finally, Get your most generous or richest friends to donate early in the appeal because these large donations will act as an anchor for subsequent donations and hopefully you'll get to raise more money as a result. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Alex Evans from London Business School. That was really interesting. So did you look at the marital status of the person who's fundraising? Presumably that would affect uh, the competition elements. Um, we don't have any information. The information we have is really, really noisy. So all we basically know is the gender of the fundraiser, how attractive independent raters perceive them to be, and roughly how old they perceive them to be also, which is actually, they're quite correlated. Um, so we don't actually have as much information in the data as we would like. So like you've said, we don't know if they're married or not. We don't know whether donors that are given to them are perhaps related to them or unrelated or whether the donors themselves are married or not married. The fact that we find this effect, despite the fact that we are including so much noise in the data, I think makes it even more striking because just as you've said, probably there are some instances where we wouldn't expect a competitive response, but they've had to be lumped in with our with all the data. So. Yeah, the short answer is no, we don't have that information, but it would be nice to have it. So I guess in terms of your fundraising tips, if you're married, don't have your hands in the photo if you're not wearing wedding <laughs> Hello, Casper von Schenk from Warwick University. Um, I was wondering whether you have any measure to find out how many people give up in the competition. So say I want to impress a young lady with my hundred pounds I have as a PhD student and I see someone donate £10,000, I might invest my limited resources somewhere else because of that. So do you see any change in the frequency of donations by men? Um, or do we have any way to find out? So the, num the number of donations following a large donation isn't different, it's just the size of the donations. So I think that gets at what you're asking to an extent. We can't really tell whether or not people that would have given when they arrive at a page then decide not to. We just don't have that information. Hi, I was wondering if uh, this could be extended to other kinds of economic behavior as well. I was thinking, and this is, uh, I have no scientific data on it, but I was thinking about casinos that also use lots of attractive women and uh, even uh, investments uh, people who work in banks say that, uh, well, at least in Brazil, they do that. When lady managers want to uh, reach their deadlines, their goals or something, they always go dressed very sexy and very attractive. And uh, male investors will really say, you know, they give all the money, their own money, to their own investments, but wherever the, the lady is suggesting, the manager is suggesting. So I don't know if this works only for donating to other people or, you know, attractive women make men uh, use their money more carelessly or whatever. 
Um, I think definitely that is that could be tested. I mean, from previous research, we do know that there's definitely a beauty premium in the sense that more attractive individuals of both sexes are more likely to earn more money. And whether or not that's male employ employers losing their mind when they come across these attractive women and suddenly paying them a premium, I mean, we don't. I don't know, but there is evidence of that sort of thing. Um, in terms of like risk-taking behaviour, that's also been documented that if you show, if you put men in a mating frame of mind, for example, by presenting them with this very attractive lady, uh, then risk-taking behaviour is increased. And there's a good evolutionary reason for that. So, um, yeah, I think you probably can apply these sorts of insights to other domains. This is different in the sense that it's really in the context of helping behaviour rather than... Um, self-serving, risky behaviour, per se. So we're looking at full-blooded men who are wanting to outbid other men for the attractive girl on the page. What would gay men do? Good question. I mean, so the, just like the question earlier about do we know if people are married or not married, we've got no data on donors' sexual preferences. So we have to assume in our data set that we have got some guys who are not interested in signalling to attractive females and might actually be signalling to attractive males. Um, that is basically noise in our data. So our result comes out because most people are heterosexual um, and we find the result as we predict, but that's not to say that male competition wouldn't also occur for the pre for other men. We just can't, we can't pick that up because we don't have that type of information about donors. Would you hazard a guess? I mean, it would be really speculative. I would, I would, I, I would have thought that if, uh, if, if there's something in the male, in a man, in the male evolved psychology that uh, is subjectively rewarding about competing for mates, maybe that should be found whether you're competing for mates of the opposite sex or of the same sex. But I would really have to say that is a, you know, that's a testable hypothesis. I wouldn't advocate it any stronger than that. So in the case of the peacock, if they have a larger tail, they have to have better genetic makeup to actually carry the weight and the cost of that tail. In the case of men, um, having more money doesn't signal to me that their genetic makeup is better. It signals to me that they have higher status. So I was wondering if you could develop on that. Yeah, so um, that's true. Um, but there's good, there's good reason to think that having access to more resources, being more wealthy or being higher status or being higher in power are things that might be indicative of your underlying quality as an individual and might be things that a female partner should pay attention to because they're things that can influence your ability to invest in your offspring and therefore the quality of your ensuing offspring. So. It might not be that rich guys are better genetic quality than less rich guys, but nevertheless, they are. They might be signalling something about their ability to invest in offspring, and that should be salient from a fem from a female's point of view. Great. Thank you very much, Nicola, for that fascinating session. Um, so, in this session on altruism, I must confess that I started doing research on altruism. Not so much because I was interested in kindness, per se, but because I was interested in money. Uh, in particular, I was fascinated by the finding that money doesn't seem to buy quite as much happiness as many people assume, and I wondered whether people might be able to get more happiness out of their money if they spend it a little differently. So to begin to explore that question, uh, my collaborators and I sent research assistants out on our beautiful campus at the University of British Columbia armed with cash. We walked up to people in the morning and handed them either a five or a $20 bill, which we asked them to spend by the end of the day. But there was a catch. We told half the people they had to spend the money to benefit others. And we told the other half they had to spend the money to benefit themselves. So what did people do with this extra bit of cash in their hands? Well, when we told people to spend the money on themselves, what we call personal spending, they did things like buying makeup and jewelry and lots and lots of food and drinks. In contrast, when we told people to spend the money on others, what we call pro-social spending, they still bought lots of food, now they shared it with other people. In addition, one student bought a toy for a younger sibling and others made donations to charity. 
So the question is, which type of spending would leave people happier by the end of the day? When we called people back that night, we found that people who had been randomly assigned to spend this money on others felt significantly happier compared to people who'd been assigned to spend the money on themselves. Since that original study, we've replicated this basic effect in countries around the world. Uh, so for example, we conducted parallel experiments in both Canada and the East African nation of Uganda. We asked participants in both countries to look back and vividly reflect on a time where they'd spent their own money on either themselves or somebody else. Now, as you might guess, the kinds of spending descriptions that people provided differed almost as much as the countries themselves. So for example, when we asked people to think about a time where they spent money on others, one person in Canada wrote, I spent $20 for two dozen red roses from Costco for my mother's birthday. By contrast, faced with exactly the same instructions, one person in Uganda wrote, last month I gave money to a friend to buy medication for his aching ulcers. So I have to be honest with you, as I was sitting in Uganda reading through these spending descriptions, I thought, okay, well, we're probably not gonna replicate in Uganda what we've previously seen in Canada, because the kinds of spending descriptions that people were providing just felt so different. And yet, to my surprise, when all the data were in, we actually saw exactly the same effect in both countries, whereby people felt happier when they looked back on a time where they spent their money on others rather than themselves. Since then, we've analyzed correlational data from over 100 countries, and what we see is that people who donate money to charity are happier in poor and rich countries alike. Now, the fact that we see this warm glow of giving in such diverse cultural contexts made us wonder if we might even be able to see a kind of early version of this effect, even among very young children. To get at this, we brought in toddlers just under the age of two to the lab. Now, I have a two-year-old. I can tell you toddlers don't care that much about money. <laughs> so rather than working with money, we use the sort of toddler equivalent of gold, namely goldfish crackers. So we provided toddlers with a windfall of goldfish for themselves, as well as the opportunity to give some of those goldfish away. So I'm going to play a quick video of one of the participants completing our study. Now I want you to meet my friend Monkey. Hello. Do you want to say hello? when she got to give some of those goldfish away. And in fact, when we bring in dozens of toddlers and have their emotional responses objectively coded, this is what we see over and over again. So the fact that we're seeing this warm glow of giving both among very young children as well as uh, among adults around the world points to the possibility that the pro proclivity to experience joy from giving to others may actually be kind of baked in to human nature. It may even be a sort of fundamental human need. Now, if that's the case, it's likely that we should be able to see some physical health benefits associated with pro-social spending. So to begin to explore this idea, we started by looking at blood pressure. Uh, as we heard from Hal Varian earlier today, high blood pressure is a very strong predictor of uh, mortality. Uh, the World Health Organization tells us that over 7 million premature deaths per year are attributable to high blood pressure. And very much in line with the sort of theme of this conference, blood pressure can be modified through behavioral interventions, and perhaps equally importantly, we can measure it accurately and easily. 
So to begin to see whether pro-social spending might have implications for blood pressure, we started by analyzing data from 186 older adults who had been diagnosed with hypertension. Uh, we took these adults from uh, the Midlife in the United States study, which has been following older adults um, over time and charting their health status. Now looking at this data, what we see is that the more money these individuals reported donating to friends, family, charities, and other organizations, the lower their blood pressure was two years later, both diastolic and systolic. Now, of course, if I were to um, pop up thought bubbles above everyone's heads, particularly perhaps the economists in the room, you could easily generate other explanations for this finding, right? There's lots of third variables that could potentially account for this relationship. Um, so I should say uh, this relationship holds up when we control for income and other indices of wealth, for age, gender, physical activity, and pretty much the kind of kitchen sink of covariance that you could think of. Now that said, to really establish that pro-social spending has a causal impact on blood pressure, we needed to conduct an experiment. So to do this, we recruited 73 older adults with hypertension, and we gave each one of them $120 to spend over the course of our six-week spending study. Now we randomly assigned half of them to spend this money to benefit themselves. So we said, you've got to spend all of this money to benefit yourself, or we said, you've got to spend all this money to benefit others. Now we measured uh, blood pressure both before the trial began, as well as in the weeks after people spent their money. Now first off, I should say, everyone liked getting this money, uh, but when we gave them this money and told them to spend it on themselves, we simply saw no impact on blood pressure. Blood pressure didn't change one way or the other from the beginning to the end of the study. However, when we gave people this same amount of money and told them to use it all to benefit others, we observed a significant reduction in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And in terms of magnitude, this change in blood pressure was equivalent to that typically seen when people begin antihypertensive medication or start engaging in high frequency exercise. Now I wanna stress that these results are quite new. While the happiness results, I think, are fairly well established at this point, uh, this health research um, it, you know, is uh, quite sort of the newest thing from our lab, and I really think that other labs need to replicate this research. That said, I think this work provides some tantalizing evidence that spending money on others may not only be heartwarming, it may also be quite literally good for our hearts. Thank you. Can you speculate? Very, very quickly on the biological mechanism upregulation of the parasympathetic nervous system, probably. Right? Yeah, so I, my, I am one of a team of researchers on this project, including a uh, prominent health psychologist and a geriatric physician, and they would be really the ones to answer that question for you in, a, in an ideal way. And I should say, too, that we, in this project, in no way did we identify the physiological mechanisms. Um, however, we would speculate. Um, <laughs> uh, that there, uh, the HPA axis is likely yeah. involved, um, and you know, in terms of the more detailed, fine-grained aspect of that, I would probably refer to you to people who are actually trained in medicine. <laughs> I was wondering, does that sort of warm glow of charity change when you're face to face or just sort of filling in a form online? And how can we enhance that warm glow if you're filling in a form to donate? Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think that's such a fascinating question. So I think that um, uh, one thing I really want to be clear that I, think I didn't get to say in the sort of 10 minutes is that simply lightening our wallets doesn't automatically make us happy. Um, and so you know, how exactly that donation experience is structured matters a lot. Um, and so um, one variable, for example, that we find is important is the extent to which people feel a meaningful sense of connection with the cause or with whoever they're sort of giving to you on behalf of the cause. And so, um, you know, one of the most common reasons that people give, as many people probably know, is, is because they were asked by someone they know. Um, so that can sometimes create a sense of social connection even if you don't feel a sense of connection with the cause. If you're doing this through an online website, I think it's more challenging, but there's also an incredible amount of opportunity. Uh, so for example, um, a, a website can enable people to see a specific person 
who is going to benefit from the help that they provide. Um, so for example, although Kiva isn't exactly a charity, I think Kiva is a very interesting model where we get to see how our uh, generosity is benefiting a specific other person. And so um, again, sort of going back to this evolutionary perspective, I think humans evolved to give to people that they know. Often we're giving to people we don't know in sort of the modern context, but if we can sort of facilitate that sense of connection with the recipient through a variety of possible ways, even in that sort of online giving context, I think we can amplify those emotional benefits, which I think can then produce downstream benefits for um, charitable giving overall. Uh, I was very interested in the fact that you found a correlation by the sound of it between rate of change, or change of uh, blood pressure, uh, over the two-year period and, and donations, and that's that, that, that's that's intriguing. Uh, and I wondered if you also found an absolute uh, relationship between rate of donation and, and blood pressure. You, you sort of think that people who are giving more would have lower blood pressure in the first place. So let me clarify. So unfortunately, in this data set, um, in the MIDAS study, participants were in the correlational study that I described. It's not longitudinal, it's just correlational in that participants were asked uh, at the initial time point to complete a telephone survey. So they reported a bunch of things like how much money they were giving to charities. And it was two years later on average that they came into the lab. So that's what we know. So again, our ability to draw causal conclusions from that data set is limited, but it's reassuring that we can see this outside of the lab. Okay, any more questions? Um, let's take this one in the middle here. And then we'll go to the back. That, that was really interesting. So what you're using is you're using money that you'd actually give them to the, to the people. So would it be, do other results generalizable to if people had to spend their own money? Because we know the work of loss aversion. So if, if it's your own money, you'd probably code that as a loss. And so you might be with, less willing to give pro-socially than if it's money that was like free money or household. Yeah, so we, um, when we started doing this line of research, we were very concerned about that um, variable. Uh, and so typically when we do work on this topic, we try to include studies that both, uh, some studies where we give people money and tell them how to spend it because it enables us to have more experimental control, and other studies where we look at, you know, for example, how people spent their own money. So the combination of that correlational methodology, for example, with the experimental methodology, enables us to say, it's not limited, for example, to like windfalls. Money doesn't have to fall on you from the sky for you to feel good about it. Although by making money fall on people from the sky, we can eliminate a lot of potential confounds. Um, I just wanted to ask about whether or not it depends also on how much you give. Um, obviously that might level off at a certain, but in terms of even thinking about dance to poor people lying, some of these people may have just sort of spent $19 on themselves and they give them $1 away, and that may still have a beneficial effect, but for people who spent the whole $20, like this. Right, that's a great question. So, so there is, we're all fine to worry about lying things to the NRA, so, um, yeah, so, I mean, to his talk, not to him. <laughs> the lovely guy, we have a paper together. Um, so, um, uh, in, we are concerned about that, and so actually in the blood pressure experiment that I described, we actually asked people for receipts, um, so they uh, were, you know, inclined to feel some degree of accountability. Um, of course, like, they could have forged receipts and so forth, but probably would have been too much effort. Um, so, um, you know, it, I guess there is some concern that people might be exaggerating the extent to which uh, they are giving. Um, but even when we sort of try to work around that experimentally, we still see similar kinds of effects. So, so I'm really interested in how you measure happiness effectively. Look, so I'm doing some work at the moment running a range of initiatives across Sheffield and we use the Warwick and Edinburgh scales to measure people's well-being and happiness. And I tend to find it's quite subjective depending on somebody's mood when they're feeling in reform as to how they rate their happiness. And it's sort of ever-changing. So people will walk out of this room today and be very happy and say they're happy because they're in a good mood. That might not be due to your intervention or giving away money or something else. So it's really interesting how you measure happiness properly and effectively, and I was wondering if you could tell us how you do that. Sure, that's great, yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, so we measure, uh, my take on measuring happiness is very much in line with Ed Geener's work, and um, he argues that there's sort of three core components to what we, you know normal people call happiness, what scientists often call subjective well-being. Um, and so those would be um, uh, experiencing a preponderance of positive emotions, 
not too much in the way of negative emotions, and then uh, feeling satisfied with your life. Like when you look at your life, are you living the kind of life you want to live? So those sort of three components together uh, comprise what, what we talk about when we say happiness. Um, now in individual studies, ideally we try to capture all of those, but depending on the study, we're not always including measures of all three of them, sometimes for practical reasons, and sometimes for more conceptual reasons. So we think that you know, if you um, spend $5 on somebody today, which you could do, uh, it, it's likely to give you a little boost in mood. Is that going to make you permanently more satisfied with your life? I don't think so. Um, but if you engage in this sort of habit of giving where when you see opportunities to be generous, you do so, then over time I think that can build people toward a higher level of life satisfaction. And indeed, that's what we see in, um, for example, the Gallup World Poll data where we see that people um, score higher on life satisfaction measures if they report donating to charity in the past month. Again, they're probably not still feeling good necessarily about that particular donation, but rather it's reflecting the way that they're living their lives. Great. Well, thank you very much, Elizabeth. And uh, I guess we'll... I, um, Rick Fubari, University of Miami. Uh, it's about giving cooperation and uh, <coughs> doing nice things to others. Is there also an art of receiving? Can, if giving is good, is receiving sometimes bad? Is there a dominant, uh, dominant submissiveness thing there, or are there already any other factors? Okay, so the question is, if giving is good, is receiving bad? Well, in general, it's, it's a lot of study on receiving. Just, just the binary answer to that question. So I think that there can be some instances where receiving something can make you, can be subjectively bad in the sense that it creates a feeling of indebtedness or obligation to reciprocate or something like that. But on the other hand, there can be, there are other instances you can think of where receiving help is either uh, rewarding because you really needed that help or it acts as an affirmation of that individual's um, value for you, how, how much they value you or how willing they are to invest to help you. So I, do, I really would think it's really hard to answer that as a kind of binary <coughs> question, like is, if receiving is good or bad. I think it really is probably context specific. I don't know what you guys think. I'm afraid I don't know of any real scientific evidence on that. Um, Elizabeth's much more of an expert. So we never really look at the recipients, but my understanding of other work is that, you know, it is possible to provide help in a way that is unpleasant for the receiver. So overhelping, where you provide help that the other person doesn't need, that implies that they're not capable, uh, can be problematic. I think in terms of, you know, it's fun as psychologists to find those places and study them, but I think that they're probably relatively rare and that it's better to, when you see somebody in need, go ahead and help them. You know, somebody who's doing just fine and, you know, doesn't, just providing them with random help that they don't want, it's probably, you know, not a great call. Okay, so I'll take the question from the gentleman in the back, who's got Mike. Great. Yeah, well, well done to all of you. Uh, excellent presentations. Um, man on the midlife crisis, have, have you nailed the certain <laughs> ideas? Be 45 myself and having found it all the rest of it. Um, <laughs> have, have you nailed certain reasons for this? Is it the lack of control, maybe, because of 45, you're controlled by other factors? And, and trying to tie up the excellent work done by Elizabeth on the right as well. I've never spent more money on my family and everything else, but I should be depressed, but I'm not. <laughs> We're touching on quite a few things there simultaneously, aren't we? I'm afraid I don't know why we go through a midlife flow. You can imagine that uh, over the last 25 years, I've been looking at these patterns, and I suppose we've tried 100 variables, you might say, in my jargon. Or we're, in other words, we're looking for something that might be an intervening variable that would drive away the apparent pure age effect. No researcher has ever, to my knowledge, found such a variable. And clearly the apes result, though it's very important to say it needs to be replicated, suggests that it, it may be very deep and nothing to do with um, citizens, civilization, and so on. Um, so we're, we're stuck. I know that's unsatisfactory, but it's such a striking pattern, and it really touches on a very important part of human life, doesn't it, that um, we need to get to the bottom of this. Hello, I'm interested in how Andrew and Elizabeth's research might drive together. So in particular, um, pro-social actions and behaviours beyond giving, um, to what extent might they be uh, a buffer against 
um, poor mental well-being and therefore leverage for, for positive mental well-being and whether that there's more policy that more, might evolve out of bringing those two things together. Uh, I, I think, if I may say so, I, I find Elizabeth's research rather persuasive. Um, we've certainly, I've certainly seen in my own work very strong observational correlations consistent with that, and, and really, scientifically, the, the key evidence um, from the done kinds of studies is the um, randomised trials, that I expect Elizabeth would say. Perhaps my quick take on it would be that the more that we can get people away from focusing on myself all the time, evaluating myself myself, the more we can get away from that, uh, perhaps the happier the civilization we can achieve. You know, that, the ramifications of that are so broad. Our latest work is on advertising, looking at links between advertising and national happiness, and, but there's such a lot to learn. Hello, I was wondering um, if we could get some reflections from the panel. We do quite a lot of work in behaviour change based on people feeling like a good person. And I was thinking back to the earlier talk where there was some difference between behaviours that people exhibit and their self, a sense of self and whether you identify as a good person, which I think most people do until they get to that 87% or whatever it was, where it just comes on the cliff and you do whatever you please. Um, we, we use a lot of asset-based messaging in the work that we do, and we've seen that that has testable results in terms of the way people look after the people around them. And I wonder whether you could give some commentary on whether you see, them, if, if that's an effect that you see here, where actually we're people by giving, or we're doing some pro-social action, are shoring up their sense of, of self, and that's where that warm comes from. So does giving make us feel like we are better people? Is that, is that essentially the question? It's sort of. It's more like, does giving bring us back up to the level that we believe we are? Okay, so much. So thinking about that clean slate that Diana and I were talking about, just giving help us. Is it uh, a bit confessional? Yeah. yeah. Is it? Wait, no, I love that idea that giving giving might be confessional. It might wipe our other sins clean and give us <laughs> give us an opportunity to to be better people. Um, I don't know of any data that specifically demonstrates that, but I think it's a fascinating hypothesis. The, the one the one thing that pertains to it slightly, although it's a slightly opposite effect in a way, is this concept of moral licensing, mm -hmm. which is where individuals who <coughs> do something good, like giving to charity, then feel like they can do something less good in a different domain. So it, it licenses them to behave more in a more self-interested manner and yet still have a consistent positive self-image. So just to add to that too, I would say, you know, it then matters how exactly we structure the environment for giving, right? So I'm a big fan of Chris Bryan's work showing that um, if you um, praise a child for being a giver as opposed to praising them for giving, it helps to endow them with this identity of, right, I'm a giver. This is part, you know, this isn't just something I did, it's part of who I am. Um, and if you can do that, that perhaps you know, then it would be very awkward to engage in those, exhibit those moral licensing effects. Um, I have a question about altruism. I studied behavioral science back in the 90s, and our core text was the selfish gene. Um, and again, today, sort of, you know, the basic tenet being that all behavior is ultimately selfishly driven. And again, today, we've heard that uh, even in terms of giving behavior, because it's all about uh, demonstrating, competing, and to make passing on your genes. But we're looking yesterday at some of the um, big challenges facing the world, like global poverty and climate change. And I kind of think there's going to need to be a degree of genuinely altruistic behavior in order to solve those challenges. So I was just wondering if in your work you come across any genuinely altruistic behaviors. I would just, just one comment I guess I would make on that is that um, I love Nicola's work and it's so fascinating to look at the, uh, the subtle variations that affect giving behavior. That said, you know, in a very theoretically, theoretically interesting way, what we were seeing in her work is that you know, it was only one out of 12 bars where there was an effect, right? And so in 11 out of 12 bars, if I was reading your graph correctly, those considerations weren't coming into play or at least you know, weren't showing up. So I think there is sort of this, we shouldn't say that just because people sometimes give for reasons that are less than lovely, 
that you know there isn't an underlying drive within humans toward giving. Okay, more questions? Um, I, could I just jump in? Um, you raise a really very important general question, a number of sub questions, really very, and, and I worry a lot about climate change. Realistically, human beings are not perfectible. Right? Human beings are not perfectible, and it's best for us to begin from that uh, kind of second best notion. And uh, therefore, I view our task as behavioral scientists in the broadest sense as being how could we, given the imperfections of humans, how, how could we create incentives to help foster the, the necessary altruism rather than decrying the, the lack of um, the, the necessary perfection? Do you see what I mean? We, I think we just have to face it. We, we've all got good things and bad things inside us in everyday language, and we need to work around that. And surely we can with behavioral science ideas. Um, yeah, um, I guess. So just to give my two cents on it, so um, I think from an evolutionary point of view, finding behaviours that are costly to the individual and yield no benefit downstream, those behaviours would come under negative selection in the fullness of time. And so that's not to say that your motive, that your psychological motive for giving has to be selfish. You can be driven by subjective warm glow or subjective well-being but ultimately evolutionary biology would question where those feelings come from and why would nature have equipped your brain with a psychology that makes you feel happy when you do something costly rather than makes you feel sad which would be kind of more sensible in a way so um yeah i think like that but that isn't to say that we can't get it we can't produce um seemingly altruistic behavior by um by, by appealing to these subjective, subjectively rewarding mechanisms that, like, like what, what Elizabeth has shown. So, and everybody cares about reputation. We know that in anonymous settings, everybody behaves or gives less than they do in public settings, for example. So there are things which are universal and not just limited to men competing over attractive women, let's say. Uh, for Nicola, um, is yours a situation where giving as a signal has become slightly maladaptive and just misplaced, or do you think your online donors are toying with the idea that they might get a call from the fundraiser or from other people who've seen their donations? Um, so I think we would be really, really hesitant to say that there's anything conscious going on here, that there's any kind of conscious motive on the part of the male donors to that they were aware of the ramifications of their behaviour, that this might make them more attractive to that specific female. Um, I, nevertheless, I don't necessarily think it has to be maladaptive. Even if you're not aware that you're, that you're doing it, it can still be a broadly good thing to have strategies that allow you to maintain a positive reputation in the presence of an attractive audience. And that might just simply be what is going on here. So you have a, an evolved mindset that drives you to maximise the benefits of helping behaviour when those benefits are likely to be greatest. And those are likely to be greatest when you're signalling in front of an attractive audience. Okay, so questions at the very back of the woman in the coral. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Monica. I'm a health psychologist for background. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about cultural differences and whether there are any observations in terms of giving and receiving in certain communities where people don't have very much to give, but they give anyway, and this is the, their way of life. So I wonder whether um, we can draw some, some learning, so maybe you have some thoughts on that? So I guess people giving in, um, in communities where they have less, but they're still giving. Is, is that what we're interested in? Yeah, and, and they seem happy. They seem I happy. Think, well, I'm thinking about Costa Rica. Right. And, you know, they say it's the happiest country in the world. And, you know, you just see them really smiling and happy. And they don't look like they have much. Yeah, I think a lesson from um, those sorts of observations, as well as from our data from around the world, is that you know, you don't have to have a lot to experience the emotional benefits of giving. Um, and, you know, to me, it really was quite striking to see 
these effects emerge in places where um, you know, we knew that the participants in our studies were struggling to meet their own basic needs. So for example, in a study that we ran in South Africa, a substantial proportion of our respondents said that they didn't have enough money to buy food for themselves or their family during the previous year. And yet we still saw just as much of a benefit among those participants um, when it came to giving to others. So as we did among you know, more affluent people in the other countries where we started out working, so you know, I think it's really a, a, an important lesson to get out there because I often hear people say like, "Oh, well, you know, people in in Canada where I live um, who are fine, but you know, not not wealthy, say, well, I'll give to charity, you know, when I win the lottery or when I become much wealthier or get this promotion or whatever." And I think it's a really important lesson of like, you know, don't don't wait till you're wealthy or to to give to charity. Don't wait till you're the CEO. Um, give a little bit now, um, because we see around the world that the benefits are the same. Yeah, and we know here that in the UK, that the lower income groups actually give a higher percentage of their, of their money to uh, charity than higher income groups do as well. So it is, it is a universal. Thanks very much. Um, Rob Walk from Stockholm Environment Institute. How do we incentivize uh, broader pro-social behavior? Uh, I can think of things like uh, consuming sustainably for example, um, given some of the things we've heard about the evolutionary push towards behaving like a peacock. Um, Hi, and thanks for the question. So, um, I mean, there are, there are so many different things you could possibly think of to try and encourage pro-social behaviour. One thing uh, might be um, insights, say, from Robert Cialdini's work, which is to either give the impression or generate social norms that are that are pro-social. So if most people in one situation are doing a pro-social thing, anybody that isn't doing it will stand out like a sore thumb and will incur much severe, more severe reputation consequences than if everybody was doing the same thing. And an example of this is things like um, dropping litter on a clean street versus a a street that already has lots of litter on it, you probably feel a lot more conspicuous throwing litter down somewhere that was pristine and clean than you would, say, at a festival, at the end of a festival, where everyone's just throwing the litter on the floor. And so things like social norms can be really powerful for making people think about how they behave and increasing pro-sociality. But the list is probably as long as your arm of things you might try, I suppose. I thank you both all for your great presentation. I've been sort of puzzling over the contrast of raising blood pressure with attractive females as I, as I did on the website, and then lowering my blood pressure uh, with altruistic giving. And so talk between this blood pressure situation. <laughs> uh, I mean, what, what is the underlying biological drive linking these types of happiness behavior? Well, we know, as I seem to have the microphone, um, I'll pass it around. Um, we know there are very powerful, very deep links between health and happiness. There's a great deal of evidence that happiness is protective. How that works, well, my colleagues can explain that. That'd be great. That health and happiness I've got, yes. that, that's known, but the link between peacocking and sort of happiness, do we have some data on that? Well, the, the peacocking is, a, is an old evolutionary idea. It makes complete sense. So I would have thought it's the happiness links that um, are less understood, but it, surely it's, it's natural to think that um, men and also women, I suppose, when they get higher status, they get happier. Or they, they feel some feeling that is like happiness from extra status. I mean, human beings seek it all the time. You only have to walk out onto the street in London to be clear about that. Um, just touching back on what was said earlier about the um the, the, the upswing when you get older. There's something about um, acceptance of one's self, one's imperfections, which for me is the underlying cause, if you like, of, 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 of happiness, of, of an acceptance of um, one's situation, one's capabilities. And just touching on the third talk around how for older people, when their value is recognized and they have the opportunity to give whether it's to share their skills and knowledge with younger people, you could think of a number of projects like that. 
Um, there is something fundamental about the acceptance of one's self which seems to drive a lot of these behaviours. So accepting, for example, that you can only afford five dollars to contribute to a fund. Um, if, one, if one sees oneself in in the right light, that the, there's a fundamental um, benefit there. If that was uh, directly or indirectly towards me, then um, I think what you say makes a lot of sense. I'd recommend to anyone here, if you don't know it, the work of a man called Valent, George Valent, who has uh, a psychiatry professor emeritus at Harvard, who's written a number of very interesting books about life stages. And later on in life, some of the words that he writes in those books uh, are consistent with what the, the words used by the gentleman. The other thing to bear in mind, I think, is an argument put forward by my colleague who's at UCSD in San Diego, a co-author of mine called Jest, Dilip Jest, a, a very well-known psychiatry professor. Dilip believes that the reason we get happier is because wisdom rises through life. And you might want to read his work on wisdom and happiness in older age. Okay, wisdom rises through life. That's a great way to end this session. Thank you ever so much for coming. Um, just a quick bit of housekeeping before we wrap up and thank our speakers today. Um, there is lunch downstairs starting now at 1. And also, Elizabeth will be at the bookstore to sign the fantastic Happy Money book. Highly recommend it. Thank you ever so much to our fantastic speakers, Nicola and Drew and Elizabeth.